Clay Patton on the Rural Radio Network. We're here at the 35th Annual CCTA Plains Annual Conference. Keynote speaker, day number one, Jim Garrish, kicking everything off. And when oftentimes folks hear Jim's name, that often associates it with rotational grazing, and that's exactly one of the aspects he's talking about. And Jim, just kind of run down what you're talking with folks here, what your breakout session is, and kind of what the key, key takeaway you're hoping folks can hit with. Started the day with session on integrating cattle into no-till farming uh, systems. There's a lot of farms around that over the last generation or two have largely moved entirely away from any kind of livestock and been strictly crop farming. But with the uh, uh, rising tide of interest in regenerative farming and ranching, almost every one you know has heard at more than one of these conferences that having livestock on the farm in conjunction with the cropping operation is a key part of really getting soils back to a healthy functional biology stage. There's a lot of challenges to doing that because if you spend 40 years getting rid of any fence or you know pond on the place you've lost all your grazing infrastructure so uh, there's a lot of questions on how do I take these open farm fields and uh, make them grazable again. One of the key aspects that we have today, or tools in our favor, are the portable electric fencing products, the portable stock water supplies. So it's not like you have to have a five-strand barbed wire fence and uh, you know big permanent concrete or steel water tanks out there because you can continue a near a uh, normal no-till farming operation and when you have a cover crop to be grazed or crop residues you want to graze um, then we can create our grazing cell perimeter fence with temporary products subdivision fence with temporary products we can roll out uh, black uh, HDPE high density polyethylene pipe to have over the surface pipelines we put easy quick coupler valve attachments in that. Uh, I showed examples of uh, different movable water tank systems and so it's really just a you know maybe a couple days work to set up a quarter section of farm ground and turn it into grazing cell and boom you're ready to be back in the livestock business again. Jim, it's amazing to see the tides, how they've changed, how, how folks are kind of interested in it once again. In your tenured career, you, you originally started in Missouri, did a lot of research down there. Now you find yourself in central Idaho, and, and really the, the, uh, the environments that you've been in, the ecosystems, they vary quite a bit from those two uh, different locales and locations. So uh, now that you've got uh, ideas, you know, really over a lot of different types and terrains, where is the best place to start when it comes to other rotational grazing, cover crop grazing, or anything like that? What's the first thing uh, folks need to have in mind? When we're dealing with either perennial grasslands or cover crops or crop residues, we always have to keep in mind that we have management objectives for those forage resources, and then we also have management objectives for the livestock we're putting out there and if we throw in the kicker that we're also in the crop farming business we have to have considerations of uh, how this is going to interface with the row cropping but in from the grazing side we are always balancing uh, livestock nutritional needs and their health with the um, uh, uh, level of utilization that we're going to put on our forage resources and so in perennial pastures and on rangeland, we talk a lot about the, the post-grazing residual. That's amount, the amount of green living material we leave behind after grazing. And then if we're looking at uh, cover crops, and we have to kind of decide, is our primary objective building soil through leaving litter out there and a lot of cover on the ground to armor that soil? Or are we primarily feeding livestock? Because we're going to approach how we utilize uh, that cover crop differently depending on which is our primary objective. 
So really defining your objective going out there and truly defining what are we doing here, what do we want this to look like. Uh, I know you also brought up the fact that some folks have even now started to take farm ground and they're moving back to a perennial type uh, forage product in there and they're leaving them more as permanent uh, hard-based pastures versus a uh, continual farming type situation. Tell us more about one of those situations and just how that came about. Okay, the, the movement away from crop farming back to grassland for some people is even though the crop yields might look good and the gross revenue that is earned on a row crop, the way that input costs have soared, uh, the actual uh, gross margin in, in any farming operation we need to be focused on what our margin per acre is, not what our gross revenue per acre is. And so even though someone might tell me, I, I can grow 200 bushel corn, and that corn's worth 720 a bushel now, and that's $1,400. Uh, they might be making no more than 100 bucks on it. And, uh, you know, if I can, could graze that same land and harvest, um, say, 800 pounds of beef per acre, and that would be approximately my expectation, is a field that is capable of producing 200 bushels of corn. I would expect to harvest uh, 800 pounds of beef if I had that in a grazable forage out there. And, oh, well, the value of that beef, its you know, value of gain might only be a buck a pound. Well, that's only $800 compared for the grazing return compared to the fourteen hundred dollars for the corn return but i could easily have a three hundred dollar margin on that uh, uh, grazing enterprise so the total dollars flowing through my bank account are near as big but what is going into my savings account is much bigger and is always impressive it, and it comes down to it breaking it down by the numbers that's what really can help say uh, you know to make it do you want to go down this path a or do you want to go down path b what do you want to look into it uh jim we appreciate the time walking us through what you're talking with folks about the experiences that you've been able to share here has been quite a uh, quite a just just to be able to sit back and listen it's been quite amazing uh before i let you go though final closing thoughts big takeaway pictures maybe important information i didn't even think to talk about or bring up while we were talking well, the breakout session that I did is called Why Managing Time is More Important Than Managing Space. And that is really focused on why going to shorter, shorter grazing periods with a higher stock density brings so many positive benefits uh, to the grazing and farming operation compared to, you know, the old style, just, you know, turn them out there for months at a time type management. You do not get a very good marginal return on traditional ranching practices. Jim, for folks to follow along uh, with this, the, the things that you do to check out your company and more, where do they need to go? What do they need to follow? Okay, you can find us, uh, you know, a search on the web for American Grazing Lands Services. Opens up our retail product store, which is electric fence and stock water supplies and forage seed. And then all of our informational resources, our bookstore, our um, electronic media that's up there, but uh, a simple search for American Grazing Lands Services, that'll get you in our front door. And that's Jim Garrish. He is your keynote speaker here at the CCTA No-Till on the Plains 35th Annual Conference in Burlington, Colorado. And I'm Clay Patton on the Rural Radio Network.